On y va immédiatement avec la présentation de notre dernière table ronde de la journée, pratiques artistiques et communauté urbaine. Je vous présente sans tarder celui qui animera cette table ronde. Il s'agit de Laurent P. Vernet. Euh, Laurent est directeur du Centre d'exposition de l'Université de Montréal. Il est titulaire d'une maîtrise en histoire de l'art de l'Université Concordia et d'un doctorat en études urbaines de l'Institut national de la recherche scientifique. Spécialiste de l'art public, il mène des recherches portant sur les modes de production et de réception des œuvres dans des publics urbains. De 2009 à 2018, Laurent a été chargé de projet puis commissaire au Bureau d'art public de la Ville de Montréal. De 2018 à 2020, il a été chargé de projet pour la collection Lune Rouge. Il est également commissaire et critique d'art. On l'accueille immédiatement, M. Laurent P. Vernet. Laurent. Merci, Michel. Euh, vous le savez, cette table ronde va se dérouler en anglais. Euh, le et donc, uh, I will switch into English right away. Uh, um, so it is my pleasure to be the moderator for this panel titled Artistic Practices in Urban Communities. Uh, la séance se déroulera en anglais, mais lors de la période de questions, il sera possible de poser vos questions en français et je me chargerai au besoin de les traduire. Urban spaces are defined as places of everyday life where we are in constant interaction with strangers. There are spaces where we coexist in a process that can be described as living togetherness, by which we learn to live with one another. By working in urban spaces, artists seek to interfere, to be present, and or to intervene in this particular social fabric. In doing so, they reveal the social, cultural, and economic dynamics that shape urban spaces. But above all, artists seek to meet others They embody the idea of cohabitation with the aim of imagining urban futures with fellow citizens. During this round table, through the artistic and cur curatorial practices of our panelists, we will look at ways of coexisting in contemporary cities through and with art while imagining possible urban futures. Let me, uh, I was thinking of introducing our three guests right away, so just to uh, move on into this question a little bit uh, quicker. So our first speaker will be Shauna Jensen, who is an associate professor of performance creation at Concordia University, uh, where she holds a university research chair in performative urbanism. Uh, Jensen is an inter interdisciplinary artist and curator. Karen Elan Spencer, who lives and works in Montreal, her act Artistic practice takes place in public spaces, but also takes the form of gallery exhibitions and web projects, where she questions hierarchy, hierarchies, uh, and investigates how we, as transitory beings, occupy the world in which we live. And our third speaker, who will be joining us through Zoom, is Abraham Cruz Villegas, who's an artist based in Paris, where he teaches sculpture at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts. His work, whether performative, sculptural, or pictural, revolves around the idea of autoconstruction, sorry about that, that, in, that is inspired by the neighborhood of Jarosco in Mexico, where he grew up. So each of our guests will have 15 minutes, and I will uh, make sure I keep the time. And our first speaker is Shauna. Her presentation is titled, Urban Scenographics Toward Partial Perspective Perspectives, situa Situated Practices, and Unsettling Existing Perceptions of Place. Thank you for this uh, tongue twister, and the floor is yours. <laughs> Yeah, sorry about that, Laurent. I know it's very academic y right now because um, it's kind of thinking through some new things. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. I want to especially thank Nathalie for the invitation to participate um, many months ago. Um, and congratulations. I'm really enjoying my day and, and sharing this space and time and thinking um, with all of you. So, yeah, this is. Um, Uh, this is me, you know, going more and more slowly public with some ideas I have about um, sonography. Um, and I'm actually not going to be speaking so much about my own work um, as a curator or working in the city. I'm going to touch upon a little bit of work I've been doing more with students um, in my capacity as, a, as an educator in a department of theatre um, at Concordia. I, I come from a background of working in theatre professionally for many, many years before I entered academia a few years ago. Um, 
And so, um, but I have a great love of, of engaging with cities and, and the politics of urban change. So that's kind of my background in terms of um, <clears throat> my research. Um, so now I'm kind of bringing in maybe like this is research, but this is pedagogy, and but this is method too. So I'm testing some things out. I'd be curious to see what you think or talk about it um, afterwards. I know I only have 15 minutes, so I, I may not get to, to the end of it all. I tried to make this, um, I, I just want to kind of like unfold some of these, this thinking I'm doing. I guess I have to go to, uh, okay, so I'm gonna do a little bit of a script, seeing as I come from theater to keep me on track. Here we go. Um, Rosalind Deutsch asks, what does it mean for space to be public, the space of the city, a building, exhibition, institution, or work of art? My approach to cities takes the city and its spatial stories as vital collaborators in creative responses to urban change. In theater, scenography has been understood as designed for performance in purpose-built theater spaces. The term refers to the sum total of the visual, spatial, and oral components of a performance. Recently, however, I would say in the last decade, contemporary cinegraphic practice and discourse has expanded and is no longer defined by the architecture of the theater or the confines of the stage or the conventional relationship to the spectator and performer or the performer to the design. So in urban settings, scenography proposes the city itself as performance and as a site in which to stage stories in built environments that were not designed for such purposes. In this view, the city is not merely a backdrop for urban performances, rather, in the view I'm trying to work with, urban scenography casts the city as a collaborator in the process of engaging publics in the often overlooked social and cultural histories of an urban location. It may do more, but this is where I'm working this is the research. So following prolonged periods of lockdown due to the global pandemic, the need to understand the diversity of urban experience and the ways in which people cohabitate and feel themselves to belong in the city seem more urgent than ever. Contemporary scenography, no longer confined to the stage, is now being used to understand the experience of urban culture, public space, and the built environment. So the research I'm engaged with focuses on place-orienting methods of scenography and how they shape other social art practices. Um, and that's a quote, by the way, from Rachel Hahn um, from um, a manifesto she wrote in 2019 called Beyond Scenography. So a part of me is interested in how, place orient how scenography does this place-orienting thing. Um, and also how scenography in the lens of performance might be used to not align worldviews, but in fact unsettle them and our experiences of place. So one of the questions I'm working with um, is how might the material and social, temporal, and spatial dimensions of urban places that scenography deals with provide new ways of thinking about the politics of urban change and cohabiting public space or, and or being in public. I also see urban scenography as a tool to critique top-down urban revitalization projects and to use Han's words, as a crafting of place orientation. Urban scenography in such a context can be a powerful method through and for rehearsing a public right to the city. And for Deutsch, urban public spheres are more than physical or fixed spaces. They are sites of practice. And this became a, becomes particularly acute in the summer intensives that I call urban sonography that I'm leading with students. And I've done two of them in the last four years. So I'm gonna, talk, I'm gonna show you a little bit of the student work and kind of put that out there and talk about that um, a little bit uh, with the time I have. But the context of the, the project we just actually did, um, I wouldn't call it a project, I would say a summer intensive for two weeks that I just finished last week with them. Um, I always need a site to work with. That site could be a community, it could be you know, a street corner, it could be a public space. So that's um, something that, it could be a part of the past, it could be a history. So um, I wanted to, to complicate things, of course, for myself and the students and, and focus on um, Square Vigée, but not 
uh, be, be present there 100% uh, all the time, but to kind of give us um, a really rich, complex, problematic site here in Montreal to work with, to respond to. So there's uh, so much history about, um, if you don't know, many, some of you probably do know a lot about Square VJ, but I, I can't go into all that history and why it looks the way it looks right now, and it's kind of shifting, which was also interesting for us. But what I will, will, what I will do is just set up a bit of the context to say that it is um, an urban park located at the epicenter of one of Montreal's downtown, um, of, it's at the epicenter of one of Montreal's downtown urban beautification projects. And as I was saying, the history of the square uh, is deep, and I don't have time to go into this, but essentially the site has been in trouble for over 60 years. Probably more. Um, so with the increase in real estate speculation and the decrease in shelters and social services in the city and the ongoing presence and struggles of unhoused people living on the streets, Square VJ can be thought of as a point of intensity. And points of intensity for, um, are, for I.L. Wiseman, sites that encapsulate claims and contestations over the right to the city, but which do not consistently reveal these claims and contestations, nor do they always easily speak for themselves. So for the students I worked with, Square VJ became such a point of intensity and an urban place from which to critically stage to use Stolo scholar Dylan Robinson's words, this is a quote, new ways to engender public felt forms of unrightfulness to the city that require the public to answer questions about how and why they have claimed the right to the city. So um, the work I was doing with the students, and I guess what I'll say is the students were, um, there was a really interesting spectrum of students that I worked with. There was 17 in total, uh, half were masters or, or PhD students doing individualized interdisciplinary um, research or working in our history or geography and urban planning. And my undergrad students in that group were um, coming from theater design, theater acting, studio arts, and also some art history. So it was a really um, rich experience for me. Um, and challenging it many times to, to bring um, that range of um, artists, practitioners, thinkers, researchers together. But, but uh, so I'm just like coming out of that, like it just finished last week. Um, but what I wanted to talk a bit about too, uh, you know, is the site um, and, and what the timing of our engagement was such that at Square Vige, it coincided with Ne Paysages, the, um, the landscape architectures architects here in Montreal, responsible for a number of many, many um, public art projects and, and other things. Um, and their project to revitalize the square, uh, which is, uh, quote, aimed at creating a harmonious environment that mitigates the nuisances that led to the square's decline. Uh, and there, I, I won't, yeah, the proposal goes on to talk about building a harmonious environment that mitigates the nuisances that led, led to the square's decline. Um, it's about inclusivity and commitment to creating a place for all users with flexible programming to encourage a wide range of users, et cetera, et cetera. I'm missing a big part if, for those of you who aren't uh, familiar with the site, but there's, 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 you know, there's kind of like four lots to the site. There used to kind of, I only thought were three, but three of them have had um, very important uh, um, public art works in them, and I don't have time to go into all of that, and those will slowly also be kind of, are being arranged and taken out and brought back to the site as well. So Square VJ's redevelopment has been framed under the aegis of, revitalized, of revitalizing wasted urban space and for bringing order and public safety to the downtown core. But what appears in their promotional material for the site's development then is an image of urban renewal which is the creation of a predetermined or planned community and consumable urban experience. So for all their intents and purposes, Nipissage has, co has imagined a so-called inclusive and harmonious environment, and their proposal appears to suggest the site's rehabilitation and that it will allay the site's apparent nuisances. But for many, the renewal of Square VJ and the concept of living in harmony is not about living in a better future. Instead, it is about power, exclusion, displacement, and struggle. The square is fre frequently used as a place of refuge and shelter for several of the city's transient and houseless homeless citizens. And according, I'll refer to Rosalind Deutsch one more time, um, according to urban critics such as her, these kinds of urban aesthetic practices 
our strategies for, for constructing unitary images of social spaces. So without question, the reification and the aestheticization of Square VJ's history will also displace its current users. So to return to Nip Paysage briefly here, where is the space for user friendliness? Um, wh where will the current users of Square VJ find a place? So this brings me back to thinking about sonography and Rachel Hahn's work around thinking about sonography uh, as a way to orient oneself in place or think about the, the positionality and the limits of our positionality in public space. Um, yes, place orienting methods uh, of sonography have this potential to shape um, other social art and art practices. Uh, what you're seeing there is an image of one of the students. So we were back in the studio, so we weren't doing anything. Um, there was in and out of being at Square VJ and being very, um, uh, very aware of and of our own responsibility and felt presence on the site at different times. But ultimately, the students were bringing all their work and their thinking um, back into the studio where we were um, kind of doing some more subjective performative mapping in the space. So we were kind of doing a DIY, filling the whole studio with their very um, effective um, experiences um, of being on site. So this is an image of one of the students bringing some of their work into the space. Um, and I'm just going to read you the course, a part of the course syllabus. Um, so in this summer intensive, we focused on sonography as a perspective um, on and or critical concept for undertaking urban research and wider performance making design practices in the city. Um, engaging with cities through the lens of performance vis-a-vis -vis an expanded notion of sonography is one way, I think, right now, to embody and understand the social, historical, and cultural experience of a city, and on the other, a critical practice to unsettle dominant narratives of place. So this intensive introduces students to contemporary theories and practices of sonography in the context and scale of cities and urban landscapes. So we've left the theater. Um, so that's what we were up to, and there's just a few more images here. Uh, again, this is what I was um, just speaking about um, in terms of doing work, bringing work back into the studio, uh, the students setting up their own um, ideas of the lot from being there and visiting. Um, we also did take a collective action on the one site where um, it's, it's currently just, uh, it's still closed off, there's no access because of the construction and the development. Um, but also we were sensitive to the fact that, you know, even the, the people who live in our regular, uh, regulars on the site weren't there either. So we felt a little bit better about being able to um, do something collective. Um, and these are just a couple of photos of a series of gestures that we all came up with and, and passed around to each other and we moved around the block and um, we had a bit of a costume. We had some pink high visibility uh, construction vests to kind of you know, mirror a little bit of the construction on the site. But the construction guys weren't there that day, actually. But, um, so yeah, we did some collective work as well, which brought up a lot of feelings for the students, uh, for sure, uh, in terms of, again, um, being aware of our own agency and privilege and responsibility of being on the site and doing research um, here or in response to the site. Um, so this is one of, this is Aya's work. Um, she was responding to Peter Nass um, fountain um, in the further east, the, the farthest east site or um, park of the whole square. Um, but again, um, thinking about this way that sonography might um, guide us through orienting feelings of place and, and help us to think a little bit less of, of planning and a little bit more of stories and connecting to that experience of the city. So again, thinking you know, the, in a much more broad way about this, this um, balance between thinking through the lens of performance and planning. Uh, I'm done, okay, yeah. You know what, I'm, I'm pretty good. I'm, no, this is good. And so I'm just again like going now through all the documentation and some of the amazing work that the students were doing. So. Um, you know, questions about how many different kinds of stories can resonate on a site that Elsie um, realized that, she, like she's, um, 
she's Venezuelan, but was born in Canada and left to, to go back to um, where her parents, of course, grew up and are from. But her father uh, was an architect and engineer working on similar kind of brutalist architecture at a certain time in history. And so she started to create this um, work with this method of loci and memory, a memory journey um, in terms of her relationship between two sites in, in um, the Americas. And, oops. Yeah, and then I'm kind of working on my own little manifesto, basically, about how sonography, this idea of cinegraphics, might work as a method for um, undertaking critical urban research. But I'll, I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Is this better? Okay, and uh, thank you so much, so much. I don't know how this works. Can I have somebody do the thing? So we're gonna start. Okay, you will lose me a little bit. We on commence avec celui-là. So, um, I have so many feelings <laughs> about this. <laughs> and I'm already disturbing the... Ah, va suivre. Merci. Super. So, there is language and then there's people. And as I'm listening to people speaking today, I'm like, the language, we have to take the language. We have to take the language into what it is that you as people are really doing. If this is really médiation culturelle, there is nothing more beautiful than that to me. Um, but if you say words like improving, or you say words like making better, or you say words like shame, you really, really, really have to think about what those words are doing and what positioning that is creating and who is making who better based on whose values. Um, I wasn't going to say that. <laughs> this is all <laughs> kind of ad hoc. So, um, how many is too many? I'm going to make you guys pass these to each other. And we're going to start in the periphery. <laughs> and as you're doing that, I'm, um, how many is too many? When I first came to Montreal, uh, I used to walk down St. Catherine Street. So this was like 30 years ago, 33 years ago. And there was a man, a very large man. And if you also walked down St. Catherine Street during this period of time, you would have seen him because he was always there. He's back against the wall uh, in front of the bay. He was in a wheelchair. Uh, he was very bushy. I don't think he could speak English or French. Um, he was often covered in coats and when I say he was always there, I mean he was literally always there. 40 below, he was there. 20 above, he was there. And I didn't know it. I never had any interaction with him. I didn't say a word. I didn't look him in the eye. I never gave him any um, money. And then one day, he wasn't there anymore. And... I can't tell you how deeply I was affected by 
this absence. So this person in the periphery of my life, who I was passing by, had a huge impact on me that I didn't even know about because I was so focused on going to where I thought I was going to go. I thought about him. I wondered where he was. I hoped he was okay. And I, obviously, I'm still thinking about him because I'm telling you about him now. And we're going to make you do the work. <laughs> so the periphery, the margins, are spaces of incredible power. They're spaces that already contain immense magic. They're spaces where um, you really have to, you have to, so, okay. <laughs> so there's the center and there's the periphery and we both need each other. The periphery needs the center, the center needs the periphery. But sometimes I feel like the center doesn't get that the periphery is just as amazing. And the center kind of goes with this idea that we have to like do good and bring this other world up into what we think is a good world. So we can go on to the next slide now. Sorry. Because I'm falling behind. <laughs> so the, the first um, slide that you saw was a performance that I did in New York City where I walked up and down 14th Street. And it came from uh, this project, which was looking at Michael Bloomberg's policies on homelessness and making text that probably nobody can really read, so I'm going to decipher this one for you. It's M-I-K-E, uh, ex exclamation mark, L-A-P-O-B-R-E-Z-A-E-S-H-E-R-M-A-N-O-D-E-L. R-A-C-I-S-M-O. La pobreza e hermano del racimo. And I probably said that wrong. Um, so there's another, <laughs> this is gonna be weird. So there's this thing that happens when you enter an imaginary space or you enter an imaginary relationship with somebody through correspondence, that's all one way. So for six months, I was in a relationship with Michael Bloomberg, who was the then mayor of um, New York City, who is a fascinating person and is actually an amazing person and has like so many good qualities. But one of his less desirable qualities, according to me, is that he was taking money away from the homeless shelters and he was refusing to support um, beds for LGBTQ, uh, et cetera. Um, and so I started following him and sending uh, letters to him and making these postcards and sending them to him to his government, because in New York the governments are separate. There's the city government and then there's the elected government and they're not always agreeing. So I just tried to like totally um, be his periphery. Because in the, I always have this feeling that in the periphery, if you can do something and not come across as too antagonistic, so not a direct um, confrontation, but a something that happens here, can it enter on the oblique? And if it enters on the oblique, can that then work through the person and so that the person comes out with their own logic and their own idea? And can I function like the man in front of the bay? Can I somehow have my art do that 
and not just address, um, well, this was maybe the, I, I started to think, okay, who has the power and how can I address them in a way that they can hear me? Um, next slide. Because I'm going way too slow. Um, it's really weird, all those numbers in front of it. My bloomers, so we can't see what it says. So the next slide. Oh, yeah. So at the end, I had the feeling I was becoming too invested in my mission. So like this one was... Um, so what was happening in New York at that time was Mike Bloomberg was making people prove that they were homeless before they could go to a homeless shelter. But Callahan versus Kerry is actually a law that is in New York that if you are homeless, the state is obligated to give you shelter. So he, was, he wasn't going against the, the, the rule, but he was also trying to find a way that he didn't have to give people shelter. So he was saying you had to prove that you were homeless. So this one is, chances are, if I show up at a homeless shelter wanting shelter, it's because I need shelter. What other proof do you need to the Department of Homeless? Um, <laughs> next slide. Thanks. And then I would make these postcards, and I would s send them everywhere, and I would post them everywhere. And I had no idea that people couldn't decipher them. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I'm really like communicating with the people. <laughs> and then I had a curator come and they were like, uh, no, I actually have no idea what, what that says. So, <laughs> oh, five. <laughs> okay. Just yell at me. Um, <laughs> So this one is, yo, Mike, I demand a plan. 4,766 homeless is a New York City epidemic. And then we can go to the next. So then I made the um, thing that hopefully most of you, uh, yeah, I think, well, I don't need to open the other one, have. And also plastered that everywhere. And on, in that, there is a text written by a friend who's a lawyer. And we can do the next one. And the next one. And we'll go to the next one, because I have to. So in Paris, I have to be really fast here. So CDDs are homeless people. Um, during the day, you had no idea, because they were, like, it was all washed away. Next one. <laughs> so I did this little thing. Um, I tried to do many things and they kept saying, no, 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 no. And I was sort of like in conversation with some of the um, older homeless gentlemen who were out front. And they were like, aren't you from America? And I was like, well, Canada. And they're like, just do it. If you try to do something in Paris that needs authorization, you're gonna be here for years. So, <laughs> thank you. I made it bread bed. As there was an exhibition going on that I was supposed to be inside, exhibiting, but everything that I proposed to exhibit inside was not acceptable. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna just do it. Uh, next one. So this is Patrick. The other person is uh, Victor. So this is Patrick's space at the City Desire. And Patrick was like, what are you doing? And I was like, oh, I'm making a bread bed um, <laughs> to lie down on, to bug people. and. Um, he was like, but that's my space. And I was like, oh, yeah. And Victor, the other gentleman who was helping me, he was like, okay, so if that's your space, can we rent it from you? And Patrick was like, yeah. And so we rented the space from Patrick, probably uh, for the amount of like a, a high-end hotel for the night in Paris. Um, but because of that, Patrick started asking more questions, and, I, and he was like, well, what are you doing, really? And I said, um, there's this thing that happens when people see food being wasted, that they feel they have the right to get angry. But if we see people, we feel like we should be respectful and walk by. And he was like, well, I don't know about that. 
Um, but he became the most amazing cultural mediator ever. He <laughs> totally talked to everybody who went in and he started handing out those um, flyers because there was French and English. I don't know which one I showed you. Um, and yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I think I maybe have time to just go through really quickly because I also just wanted to show, and again, I'm sorry about my slides, and again. So this was also another project that took place on public, in public space. Um, and I wanted to, sh to give you a visual of uh, contested space, where somebody, be like Patrick, where somebody believes that they own a space because we are territorial beings and we do tend to have this sense of ownership over space. And so the people in this store believed that they owned the sidewalk, which they don't. Uh, next slide. So they called the police. And the police came and they were like, no, 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 uh, this person actually has the right to be here. Um, and actually I had the right to take, to, to um, charge them for assault because they had ripped the sign out of my hand and they had ripped it. Um, but I, I didn't do that. I mean, I didn't charge him with assault. Okay, I think that's it. That's it? I have 30 seconds. <laughs> um, so now I don't know what to say. <laughs> so we can just go to questions. Um, no. uh, the, the other person. I was just thinking, I've been working with artists for about 15 years, and I've, I've never had an artist telling me to yell at her. So. <laughs> Especially during a conference about cultural mediation and <laughs> relationships with one another. Uh, let's move on to our third speaker, uh, Abraham. I do not see him on the screen but he will be showing up now. Yep, so his presentation is titled Recent Art Activating Projects and I will be back uh, in front of the camera to tell you you have five minutes left and one minute left. Hello, thank you. I will just uh, share my screen so we can just uh, continue, thank you. So, um, I just want to um, share with you some of uh, recent projects I've been doing that are quite related to the subject matter of these uh, reunions. Uh, I hope you all list, uh, can hear me and you can see this presentation. Is this okay? Um, I've been making these uh, projects that start, with, they start with drawings that are very silly uh, sketches uh, that I make like uh, in three, five uh, seconds, literally. And then I share them with uh, people in institutions or galleries. And they ask people, local people, normally the staff of the museum or volunteers to construct sculptures after the, the drawings. And so sometimes I suggest like materials, in this case, beer crates, or, but it could be anything in fact. Most of them, I ask them, I ask the people to make some holes in one of the sides so they can uh, resonate if, if they are used like instruments or so. Then, uh, of course, I tell them that they can make them the sculptures the way they want with the materials they have at hand, mostly recycling, and they can also paint them if they want with different choices. Sometimes it could be suggestions that I give them like a pink and green uh, together or black and red or at the end they do whatever they want. And then they, uh, they, they are exhibited in exhibitions and uh, they can be used in what I call activations by different people that the museum or the institution uh, call for a uh, the activations. This is in Zurich at Kunsthaus, Kunsthaus Zurich. And uh, for this, uh, 
uh, when people come to the museum, they can do whatever they want, as I said. And it, can, it was... The workshop today is about trying to interrupt or make some sort of crack in the, in the flow of how people are visiting uh, Abraham's exhibition. So my work has to do with arrhythmia and how to generate little cracks and things in space that interrupt. So like when a manifestation or a, a political intervention in a city interrupts the city flow, it's a little bit the way I would like to approach it. Sometimes I invite people I know, like friends, like Nadia that you just saw, and they, they do their own thing. There are no more instructions for me, and it's free to do whatever they want with local people always that they all, of course, also add some of their own interpretations. And so this was organized by Martin Nunez, a friend of, from Mexico, whose uh, organization, Ludica, uh, they make uh, boards for skating and so, but they also uh, produce their own furniture for, for skating. And in this case, they, they were allowed to use the sculptures as uh, skating furniture, as they do in parks and so. So they, there is a program of activations during the exhibition time and then they, they like uh, almost every day or every week at least, they can organize different activ activations that could include mostly a, a, like a di diverse and a plural perceptions of reality, like uh, through the use of the sculptures. These are just examples. <laughs> The fascination for primates that we share, Abraham and, and myself, brings us to the question who we are, where do we come from, where we go, you know, these uh, essential questions. We don't know whether we are humans before uh, starting this self construction, or that this self construction made us humans. So that's the question that. Sometimes it's like a talks, like this gathering of local people. In this case, it's refugees, for instance, that talk about their own uh, activities in a city that now belongs to them, but uh, where they were formerly uh, migrants, immigrants. And then all of these produces a very uh, eclectic and sometimes contradictory a space and a scenario for discussion and encounter that, of course, a, in which the sculptures become maybe invisible or not necessarily the most important thing. This exercise allows me almost all the time not to be there or not to be the protagonist of the thing, excepting like when I participate in, in, in the activities or when they, they have to say that it's a project uh, myself. I, I organized. This is in the National University in Mexico, in the Museo Universitario de Ciencias y Artes. I will run this faster a bit because it's uh, a bit long. But this is a former a museum for art and science in the very heart of the university. And for this, I, I called friends to participate making a art with a recy recycled objects and materials from the, the university in their storage and in the, from the garbage or from anywhere they could find the different faculties and so. But also I asked them to call their own friends, their, their own uh, communities, let's say, to participate and to make whatever they wanted with no curatorial program, with no program properly, but just like improvising everybody and making all kinds of things that you can see it's very open uh, or not only physically, but also conceptually and uh, to any activity. There were some students that participated, uh, sports people, me mechanics, uh, musicians, choreographers again, and so, and a documentary like uh, there, it's Yasodari Sanchez from Monterrey City. She called her own, her own students from the University of Monterrey for documenting the whole event and making interviews. So, Sorry for the rush, but then, I mean, so we can see some other stuff. And uh, like students, they make their own uh, milpas, you see. 
And uh, this is something else in Austin, in the contemporary Austin. And here, maybe I can allow you to listen. So we're here in an exhibition by Abraham Cruz Villegas titled, Hi, How Are You, Gonzo? The kinds of work, first of all, range from quite a few wall works. They're very beautiful and freehand, symbolic on a lot of levels, but also very playful. There's also a series of blind self-portraits that consist of the detritus from the artist's life that he then paints over. In addition, uh, the public will be able to experience these set of objects that are meant to be used through activations throughout the course of the exhibition. So this word activation, it suggests something like a performative piece, but it's different because it is meant to invite the public to come and participate in a way that they're typically not able to do in a museum exhibition space. These cultures, they are invitations to, to do something, to think about how this could be activated in many ways. I think it becomes also a space where transformation is allowed and invited. I thought it was going to be like a lot of art plastered around the wall. We didn't know that ourselves are going to be like the exhibit in the space. That was pretty cool. Like I walked in and it immediately felt like play. It was so open and all ages, all colors, all like all everything. It's super freeing. Lo que más me gusta es entender que somos comunidad y que podemos muy bien intercambiar todos nuestros saberes en un espacio en donde a una persona se le ocurrió que concluyera. I think it's been exciting to me to see the community rally around this exhibition. There was a vibrancy around the exhibition opening that was wonderful and felt very inclusive. So I would invite everybody to come experience the exhibition through July 14th at the Contemporary Austin. So, this is like uh, different activities again that were part of this with different communities like uh, DJs, people making a exercise, uh, roller skate organization, feminist communities of uh, mothers, and so on. This is in Aspen, a similar project where I sent exactly the same drawings to be, uh, let's say, to, for them to make interpretations of them in three-dimensional volume. And then they, they are, again, like uh, exhibited there. Sometimes I make these drawings that are, of course, destroyed at the end. This is in Santiago de Chile, and here I sent the same drawings, and then they made interpretations, but in this case, it, it was not the staff of the museum, but different types of communities from the, the area, like uh, people who took the land illegally, and then they, they were producing some sort of activities, and, and this is, has no beat, no audio, sorry. Maybe this is not so interesting, but the construction of the works, by the different communities and how they, let's say, saw other communities work ex existing in the same place, producing different dialogues. And then they were activated by immigrants as well, like lots of uh, Venezuelan refugees at a certain point. And uh, then all everybody here who participate as volunteer or so, they have credit as artists or they are, they are the owners of the works they make. And uh, me, I don't really participate at the end. I am a visitor like anybody else who's uh, knowing for the first time the works at the opening many times. All of these works uh, were, these projects, I mean, were made before the pandemics. And uh, I found this very interesting as a process and as a methodology for making art projects from afar. I was living then in Paris uh, until recently and then, uh, of course, I kept making these 
uh, from Paris in different places, not traveling. And I found this very, let, let's say, healthy in terms of not, uh, not, not taking a plane, not, not uh, me not being not necessary, let's say. That's it. These are some images from the show. And lastly, this, this is a project I just made in, in my gallery here in Mexico, in Curimansuto. Por ahí estoy retomando también, no solamente el material físico, sino también el material simbólico, tradicional, cultural, de toda esta gente con la que he trabajado, que son los músicos. Eh, también con Mayra, con poeta, activando las esculturas. Your microphone is turned off. Ah, sorry. Did you, did you hear me at all or not? <laughs> yes, we did hear you. Ah, okay. Sorry. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you to the three of you for your uh, very insightful presentations. I have to admit, I didn't have time to come up with a proper question um, with all the vaudeville happening. Um, one thing that really struck me uh, listening to all three presentations, uh, you mentioned Rosalind Deutsch's work, I believe, in your presentation, Deutsch, um, who wrote in the mid-90s about homeless people, and you talked about homeless people, and then we looked at different practices that urban spaces don't, uh, aren't flexible enough to accommodate still, uh, such as skateboarding or all kinds of uh, activities, and I, it's amazing to me that uh, with all that knowledge, we still need artists to be so engaged with the urban environment, with other fellow citizens to show us that cities are not inclusive, they're not flexible, they're not for everybody. We still need to, f to fight for the right uh, to the city, I guess. Um, I'm just curious to hear about your engagement towards uh, fellow citizens. Uh, what, uh, what motivates you? I guess, Karen, you talked a little bit about it, but what would be at the core of your engagement towards other citizens in ur urban space? Thank you, Laurent. And I, I just think it's really interesting, too, because I, I thank you for sharing your work, Karen, because I wasn't familiar with your work. And we also have never met or talked. So that was kind of an interesting um, synergy or whatever we want to call that. Well, I mean, you know, um, I like I have a lot of questions about related. I'll try, I don't know if I can answer that question, but I guess my reflection on that is that um, it's about making things public. So it may not even necessarily be about the, the right to the city, but I mean, a lot of my work as a curator has to do with collaborating with communities and building relationships over really long periods of time. So what I was sharing today was, you know, now kind of, you know, trying to open up different ways of thinking um, and learning and making, opening a door to a lot of different kinds of learning moments with students and how they're thinking about um, their practices, you know, public art, uh, in, in that kind of more dominant way that we know or understand what that means. But, but also kind of reflecting on, um, you know, these, these plans that seem to be responding to the, this, there's this perception that spaces are empty, right? And that's a very colonial concept. So, um, you know, Peter Brook is a great theorist, um, of his time, I think he's still alive. He wrote a book called The Empty Space. And there is no such thing. So I've always had a problem with that. So, but I don't get to really teach that or talk about that. So like, again, my, my kind of passion for, um, you know, equitable, um, an equitable use of the space in the city or that, that if everything is over-programmed or every single space in the city is programmed, then there is no room for um, for other kinds of agencies. And I think that, that, I don't know if I'm answering this question at all. Or Anyway, I'm going to hand it over to you. But I guess just to say that part of what I'm thinking through and want to be thinking through with students who are coming up through, you know, making theater or performance in a more broad way or 
um, you know, working in planning and geography and in the environment is to be thinking about space as a collaborator and that there is no one whole perspective or view, that partial perspective, which I really didn't talk about, is Donna Haraway. So a lot of my thinking that then goes into practice is coming from that feminist lens, um, a queer a queer practice. Um, so thinking of the city and, and spaces like the ones that are being revitalized or so-called revitalized and for who, like who are these transformations for? And if we get to think about more than human agency shaping space also, then we're also starting to connect more with, you know, um, I guess this, these, these different kinds of intersections. Um, that's what I have to say. Um, so I, there might be a little bit of a misconception about my work. <laughs> so I don't really work with community. Um, I just kind of go and um, hang out for long periods of time. Um, and I'm not really interested in bringing that, I'm, I'm, I'm not interested in like making a community. Uh, <laughs> it's, um, and Laurent, yes. homeless people are the most visible public people. They live their stripes <laughs> lives on the street. It's like when we say, like when we, when we think of invisibility, it, I find it so weird because it's like, well, actually, they're, they're super, hyper visible. Um, everything they do is, is uh, I mean, if they're absolute homeless, and there's all different kinds of homeless, but if you're absolute homeless, you're eating, you're doing all kinds of things in public because you just don't have any other space. And uh, I don't think of myself as making that community more visible, I, th I am, may maybe I'm a grifter? Is that a word? <laughs> um, that, that, that I, I, I learn from being there. Um, they are, I'm, I'm, I'm receiving. I'm not, yeah, I'm not really giving. Uh, <laughs> Um. Abraham, would you like to? I, I thank you. This is very, very helpful because it helps me in, in not saying anything new. I'm in exactly in the same uh, channel and same track in terms that I don't really find myself giving nothing, but the, it's more like uh, the one who learns is me. Like when I, when I have a new project or a new experience uh, or that you can call my project, that's the only thing maybe that I can have bear my name. Uh, is that like, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm more receiving and then I just don't want to construct or to create or make community. How can I make that in a country or a culture that I don't know, uh, including any of the places where I made these projects and th those where I'm making new ones. And then I, it's more like uh, I try to use literally the space of the institutions or art spaces to produce these encounters in which we can listen to each other, we can produce questions to each other, and then we can maybe make new links to new possible encounters and activities. But I'm not trying to teach or to nothing. I'm more like a, a yeah, learning. That's a proper word. Like in, I'm, I'm really privileged, of course, about this, not only because of visibility, but only just having the opportunity to listen to different local, you can call them communities, I think, it's a lot. Yes. What's that word you use, Karen? I'm sorry. Grifter. Which means? Um, does anybody have a dictionary? Uh, <laughs> I think it means somebody who attaches themselves to something and sort of extract something, I think. Un commensal? You know, way cooler. Way cooler. <laughs> Just, uh, do we have a question from... Yeah. 
Merci beaucoup. I want to thank all three of you. That was really inspiring, and I have a, at least one question for each of you. Um, I guess I'll start with uh, Shauna Jensen. Um, did your students, with, uh, on the Square Vigé project, did your students interact with anyone living or hanging out at Square Vigé? Uh, there were a couple of encounters that weren't, um, like they didn't go, we, you know, we talked about this a lot, right? We talked about the ethics of that a lot. Um, and they, there was a couple, there was, well, there's a story. Um, of one of the students walking up in um, the um, Claude des Berges, I don't know, the, the, the center uh, square. Um, and then they left, they, they came back down because there's actually a form in, the, in that public artwork in the sculpture of it. And then she came back down, she sat down and they were, they were assigned to go do some sight writing. So they were hanging out kind of at different times on one day, very, they, they weren't together in huge groups or anything. And they were just, they were, they were the sight writing, meaning kind of they were just journaling. They were given some prompts just about thinking about the senses and then that was moving forward in other ways. Anyway, I'll just say that somebody who uh, might have been a regular in the park uh, took a, what do you call those, construction cones that was around somewhere in the park and put it at the very edge of the end of that that one part of that piece of public art, the Claude uh, Theberge, and she was she was she was unsettled by that, right? Because she couldn't figure out if that was then a, like a sign of like get off my get out of my space. Um, another student commented said it could have been, it could have also been maybe like be careful because there's a drop off on the other side. Like it's you can't get down easily. You could if you fall off that edge, you could hurt yourself. So, I think. You know, and I don't mean to make it sound like, yes, these were really, really great experiments um, with the students, but they, some people, you know, said hi to them, but they didn't go actively. They were instructed to not go actively having a conversation with people because, again, um, this is a home to many, many, many people. So, but the idea was to actually be critiquing the nit passage plans as well, right? And then also understanding from the archives this kind of... Um, on the ongoing transformations of that site in the city. So this is also why the, store, the students came back to the studio with different ideas of how to respond, um, and not with like documentation of, I mean, I guess what I'm trying to say is like there was nobody who was, um, there were no encounters that were, you know, un, uh, that were solicited, um, and I don't think there were really many unsolicited either um, that, I, that I know of, but we talked a lot about that. So I don't know if that's answering your question. Yes, thank you. Um, to Karen, Karen Elaine Spencer, um, that was so inspiring, everything you said. I'm curious to know if um, uh, Michael Bloomberg's office ever responded to your cards, and where is Patrick now? Do you know that, that um, the fact that he kind of became a mediator uh, was really uh, interesting to me. I, I'm kind of curious to hear about that. So I heard back once from Michael Bloomberg and it was from his department of mental health. <laughs> 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 A form letter. Um, <laughs> and for Patrick, um, I don't, he was really, uh, he could see situations and take them and turn them to his advantage. Um, and he was probably one of the youngest of the, of the people who were sleeping. So I have this idea that may not be right at all, that, um, that he found his way and that it wasn't going to be like a, a for, forever thing. Um, and even if he, in so-called terms, didn't find his way, he's still totally being Patrick, <laughs> I'm sure. But yeah, I don't, I didn't, um, I don't, I never went back to the city des Arts or to Paris, actually, so. I'm sorry, my questions are like really down to earth. Um, <laughs> Uh, to Mr. Cruz Villegas. 
Um, I'm curious to know if, uh, well, that was really, really super inspiring. I, I think museums should um, do that more often, have artists invite people in and everyone in to do kind of whatever they want. But I'm really curious to know, um, did you have any resistance from some of the museums or uh, did they like, do they mostly accept right away this uh, free, uh, wild and free exhibition type uh, event or I don't know, I don't even know how to call it. Is it, do you call them exhibitions or events or so, yeah. Well, um, yeah, I don't know either. I mean, it's like uh, something that I'm trying to construct the way I'm making it. And then, and then uh, I, I have to say that in, in, no, no, I, I had no resistance. And it, was, it, it almost always happens like uh, with lots of companionship, let's say, with the institution people. So starting with the invitation, they invite me. And then they, we discuss the project and they agree or not with the ideas. Of course, there, there are always like uh, issues about uh, health and safety and mostly about children and uh, the museum being sued and, you know, legal, uh, etc. And uh, me, of course, I don't deal with that. And it's them, is the education office or the community center of the museum or so. And it's them who make the open call for communities to participate. In Austin, for instance, instance there was a, a group of uh, feminist DJs. They are called Chulita Vinyl Club. And the, the Chulitas came every week to, to make parties. And they proposed to call their own different communities and groups. So I didn't do any of that myself. It's Again, it's, it's more the institution itself and then the different and diverse people there uh, who, who decide the, and, and, and they put their wish to participate in front and then they organize themselves to, to accordingly with the health and safety, et cetera. And that's it. And, and then uh, it always happened in a very good way, in a very nice way. And also something that I like a lot of this is that almost all of these activities are made with no budget. It's a very interesting thing that we say, we have no, we cannot pay you, but it's, a, it's your decision to participate. And then uh, many times it's, it's like, and now we are making in Mexico, in San Miguel de Allende, a new project that will happen in September. And it's a public, uh, it's a government uh, museum. They have literally, literally zero money, zero. And we are making this a uh, big, big, big project with hundreds of people with no money. So it's more about like agreeing and, trying to be together. This togetherness is the real engine and the capital of the project more than money or any other thing that I can say. Bravo. <laughs> Congratulations. It's uh, really, really, really inspiring. Do some museums invite you back? <laughs> Thank you very much. We have time for, yeah, another question. So uh, actually the question is for the three, the three of you. Um, I was moved by the, the way people reuse some uh, spaces that are not meant for um, uh, intimate uh, use. But as you said, Shona, uh, the Parc Vigé is a home for many people and re it reminded me um, an artist residency that was uh, actually that was in Square Vigé too, or maybe Cabo, I can't remember. It was with the uh, Execo organ uh, organization a couple years ago, and uh, it was about um, uh, recreating um, homely space in the outdoor space, but uh, mainly spaces used by um, uh, homeless people. And uh, they were using the word kitchen to designate the tables, the picnic tables, actually. So for them, it was the kitchen. And uh, also they were using like the, the, I don't know, the sleeping area uh, a certain way. And uh, I like how disruptive 
those words can be, so we don't see the spaces the same, and we can see the reality through the eyes just with one word, kitchen, and also with the word bed, you know? Uh, so did you uh, saw uh, or um, heard some of those words that were uh, redesigning spaces? And it's for the three of you. Of course, I know uh, in museums it's maybe a little bit different, but uh, it's, it's the same idea. Thank you. Uh, okay, I'll start. Um, that was be that's beautiful. <laughs> uh, and it was probably Cabot Square because Cabot Square ha used to have picnic tables. And uh, after it got uh, changed, now there's no picnic tables anymore. Um, so I hung out at Cabot Square for about four months, one summer and maybe three months the other summer. And there was a man there and his name, he, he didn't want to give his name, so he was called No Name. And whenever some activity came into the park, he would leave because it felt like somebody was taking over his space. So it's, it's hard to work. Uh, there's many, 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 many communities, but often the community that uh, has deep roots within a, a space like Cabot Square are there because that's kind of like their only space. And then seemingly, um, you know, gentrification, it happens and it, it, it's just part of life. And, and then something that it seems like cities and, and uh, governments do is then they try to move artists into these spaces to make them palpable. And in doing so, they make it unpalpable for the people who were originally there. Because often those people are there because they can't function within the larger society. Um, so that didn't really answer your question, <laughs> but it's a response to your question. Okay, I'll be super quick, but thank you so much for bringing, I think you're, it's Dar Dar that had that project there. So, so we, they're, they're, um, they're in St. Uh, Little Burgundy right now, actually. So that's an artist collective that's moved around and there's some, a great archive about that at the CCA and maybe in some other libraries. There's a monograph of the work they did when they were situated on Square Viget, I think from 2002 to 2000, in their early to late 2000s or something. But what I love about what you brought up about the language, um, or so again, it's the spatial these the spatial narratives of the the users of a space thinking, okay, well, this is actually my bedroom, and this is this picnic table is actually my kitchen. Um, that's that for me is like a different kind of. I mean, I don't mean to get overly academic about it, but that's a kind of scene building. That's a kind of scenography that is in the imagination of the users of that place, you know, as opposed to now there's going to be ping pong tables where picnic tables were. Um, in Square Vigée. So anyway, I just love that that was referenced, that another collective of artists had been doing this work um, for many years in and out of Square Vigée um, and also working with um, a harm reduction, a, a couple of different harm reduction uh, organizations, but that kind of language of like this, what was planned for and had a different kind of name in terms of um, a top-down plan, you know, becomes something much more... Um, yeah, it'd be, the way it be, can become personalized and people are building their own, um, their own spaces and using their own agency to shape a different way of thinking about that space and being there. Abraham, do you want to answer the question? We have one minute left. Well, not really. I just uh, want to say that maybe in terms of language, it's, it's something uh, very important what you were saying because, and the question is crucial, of course, 
because uh, in my case, English is not my mother language, French neither. So uh, I would say that in the hybrid creation of new terms, my the, a, a concept very important for me is autoconstrucción, which means the construction of houses for people who have no money for buying or acquiring one apartment or a house, you have to make it yourself. And it only happens in collaboration with whoever is around you and with whatever you find around you. And this is my main thing in life because I come from a, an autoconstruction house. And, uh, but also it means for me the construction of the self, the construction of identity in togetherness only. Thank you. Uh, Nathalie, est-ce que tu avais une question? Non, euh, ben, je, vais, je vais conclure en français si vous me permettez. Euh, merci à tous les trois. Merci Abraham, Karen, euh, Shana. Euh, je veux dire que, euh, en fait, Abraham a écrit un manifeste qui est disponible à la table de documentation. Et aussi, euh, je voudrais remercier Nouria carton qui a, en fait, commissarié cette table ronde qui a invité les trois artistes. Donc, euh, je ne sais pas où elle est. <rire> je, je, on ne s'est jamais rencontrés. Enchantée. Euh, merci infiniment.